Especially Danielle. I'm just saying, Lois Ann, I don't know what you fed her, but. Uh, so I guess you're waiting for what happened last week with Samaritan's Purse. Well, last week, first of all, we gathered 308 Christmas boxes, shoe boxes, to go to children, uh, shipped all across the world, which is absolutely amazing and awesome. It's the most, I believe, that we've ever collected. If you don't know what they are, shoe boxes were collected, stuff full of uh, stuff for kids, and uh, shipped off, and uh, it's just phenomenal. Then along with that, we took a special offering last week just for the greatest journey, which is the discipleship program that goes hand in hand with the shoe boxes, where kids are invited to come to a 12 week program to learn about Christ and to discover more about him. It costs $6 a child to do that. And they get the opportunity to go to a 12 week thing. Uh, they get a graduation, they get a certificate, and they get a Bible written in their language. And we designated all our money to go to Mexico. We couldn't designate our boxes, but we did designate our money to go to Mexico, which it'll all go there. And because of the offering, we didn't, last year, we, we, the general fund of this church matched dollar for dollar. This year, I didn't feel led to do that. This year, we just kicked in a little bit to round the number off. But because of the generosity of this body, we reached 4,000 children last week that we have the opportunity to give, and uh, which is just, you know, when, when, you, when you think about the magnitude of that, and if you're doing the math, that's $24,000 I wrote a check for on Tuesday and sent that out, which is just phenomenal. And then, uh, like Johnny and I were talking in the truck today, coming here, uh, I think Chira has kind of figured it out. It costs $7 a box to ship, and then with the box and everything, with shipping, it's around probably... $30 a box. It might be a little less, might be a little bit more, but on average, it's about $30 a box. You multiply that by 308, that's over $9,000 that you all invested in kids too. So you add that to the 24, you, that, that's $33,000, which is absolutely amazing. To come out of a church this size, and it's funny, I just got a letter on Monday from Samaritan's Purse from their uh, main headquarters with the director of Operation Christmas Child, wrote me a note and uh, thanked us for our generosity last year. And they stand amazed. They keep asking me how many thousands of people come to our church. And I said, I wrote back, I said, I insult too many people for that many to ever come. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I told them we're 200 or less. And what's amazing is I asked you to do this and I believe with all my heart that you did exactly what I asked you. You prayed and you asked God to stretch you and you gave sacrificially. And that, in my opinion, is amazing, absolutely amazing. And if you can continue to do that with all aspects of your life, I believe with all my heart that God will honor that, God will provide, God will guide you, your, your, your faith in him will grow beyond imagination. And that's really what it's all about. So on behalf of all those kids, thank you. We were excited to be a part of it. We trusted God, we got stretched, it was a blast. And uh, so just wanted to, you know, tell your friends. I, I had a chance this week. I didn't tell many of you in the church because I wanted to do it today, but I had the opportunity this week. Uh, I was at, uh, at the meat market the other day, and the, you know, they said they haven't seen me, and I said, well, we were fasting for 21 days, and the owner, and I know the guys, they all stop, and they go, you know what? I go, well, we were fasting, and one of the guy's daughter's got cancer. She's 30-some years old, and said, we were, one day we were fasting for your daughter. And, so then I got their attention and we started talking and, and I said, uh, th they mentioned a television ministry that they're kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're asking me honestly, what's it all about? And I said, it's a good ministry. I said, you know, it's just, you know, it's just not something I'm comfortable with. But I said, I, I need to go where I preach because of the fact I need slapped in the face continuously, like I believe many of you do. And, uh, but we were just talking and I said, you know, th this one ministry you mentioned, I said, you know, it's really good. I do know that they, they do a lot of ministry outside of their church, even though they got 65,000 people. And I said, it's a good thing. So they said, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I happened to just say to them, I go, you know what, guys, I, I t when I get home, I'm going to write a check for $24,000 and I'm going to give it away. And of course, the owner stops and he goes, well, can I get on your mailing list? You know, how, how, how do we do that? And they all stopped and they said, what's that for? And I got the chance to tell them about the, what, what, we got, what we did. And that you can just see the wheels spinning in their head while they're trying to figure out, 
wait a minute, you guys just gave away that much money. I said, yeah, isn't it awesome? I said, what's so awesome is, is 4,000 kids get to hear about Jesus Christ. And I said, so you get to share that with people. This is a great opportunity for you to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I really believe in personal evangelism, meaning the fact that it's everyday evangelism, where you live out your life of Christ in front of a lost and dying world. You're not some nut job, fruitcake, dimwit. You live it out with joy and, and, and trust, and, and you share what God's doing in your life and what God is doing through your church. I think that's impressive, and I think that's what God honors. So uh, use that, okay? Today, we continue with basic training. Last week, I finished up with the Trinity. I wasn't sure, but I was sure at when I started this week. Today, it's another part of the basic training, which will be on for a couple weeks. Today begins basic training priorities. Priorities. Now, let me give you a couple definitions, and I'm going to hurry because we have communion, and also I want to hurry because I need to get through laying the groundwork so I can finally get to one of the scriptures that we're going to begin to look at at this part of basic training. So here, I'm going to talk fast. You all listen fast. The definition of priorities is this. Something that is more important than any other thing and that needs to be done or dealt with first. I want you to get that definition of priorities in your mind and in your heart. It's something that is important and that has to be dealt with first. It also is the condition of being more important than something or someone else, therefore coming or being dealt with first. A priority is what you should or what you do put first. Now, bottom line is this. Priorities are what each person sees as important. I always think it's good to look at and evaluate what your priorities are. I have done that, and, and maybe it's because of the athlete part in me, you're trained as very young to have goals and priorities. And actually, we're going to talk about the difference between goals and priorities. But from the very youngest, even before I was a Christian, I, you know, growing up the way I grew up, I had a lot of chances to take the wrong path. I mean, growing up where I grew up, growing up in what I grew up in, I had a lot of opportunity just to be a dimwit and run down the wrong path. But yet, because I always kind of had this thing inside of me that I, I had a priority, I had a goal, that I believe with all my heart really protected me and kept me from taking the wrong path. I mean, I'm not saying I was perfect before I was a Christian, because I'm for sure not perfect after I became a Christian. But I avoided a lot, a lot of bad stuff in my life because of the fact I had priorities in my life set as a, as a very young, at a very young age. So I always think it's good that we look at the priorities of our life. Now, I realize that over time, priorities can change because of circumstance or whatever. For example, uh, priorities can change after you have kids. Priorities can change after you get married. Priorities can change after there's a death in your family. Priorities have a tendency to change. But what we're going to look at, there's some circumstances that will cause them to change, but I believe there is such an importance that God has established priorities for each and every one of our lives that should be and must be, hear this, un changeable. It's almost like we're going to look at a list, and I would recommend that you do this if we get to most of this in the sermon today, that you get a piece of paper out sometime today, or maybe right now while I'm speaking, and you write out what your top priorities are. And I really believe there's a few that need to be in fixed position, one, two, and three maybe. The ones underneath are the ones that can be shifted around and moved, but I really believe that those priorities, had those top ones, have to be firmly in place in every one of our lives if you're a believer in Christ. Now, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the different ones. We're going to clearly see very plainly how God has established priorities in his word for every believer in Christ to follow. Where we fall into trouble is when we as believers 
fail or choose to ignore the priority list that God has put in place for believers' lives. Now, we are going to, as time goes on, distinguish between two words, priorities and goals. Now, I got to be honest with you, as I started putting this together at the beginning of the week, I didn't really think it was going to go this way because I thought I was only going to talk about priorities until I started mixing the two together, priorities and goals. Again, being an athlete, we always have to set goals. And what's the trouble is, and I'm going to explain, there is a huge difference between priorities and goals. And what God gives to us is God gives us priorities and then he shows us goals. And I'll explain to you how those two are different, but yet they mesh together perfectly. Then they have, And the more they work together perfectly, the stronger your faith in Christ will become, the stronger your life in Christ will become. You will be able to overcome things that you never thought you could overcome. Why? Because you got the two of them working properly. I didn't really think there was that much of a difference until I really started looking at it. All right, here's the definition. Now remember the definition of priority. Here's the definition of goal. A goal is a finite and measurable thing. Once you, have, you, once you have achieved it, you move on to the next one. Now, this is what I feel. If you are only goal driven, what will end up happening, you will constantly feel like that you are always striving to fulfill the next goal. You will fulfill one, and you'll go to the next one. And then you'll go to the next one. And then you'll go to the next one. And you'll always feel like, now get this, that you're never really coming to rest because you're always striving for the next goal. And what really, if you are a goal-driven person instead of a priority-based person, you're going to come up empty every time. Because there is no way humanly possible that you can keep up with every goal that you possibly can have. Because as soon as you finish one, i got to go to the next one. i got to go to the next one. i got to go to the next one. And I really think in Christianity, as well as in just normal, everyday life, we are way too goal-oriented versus being priority-based. That's what I want to explain. Now, priorities are different. Remember the definition, it's what you see as important, what should be done first. If you live by priorities, you will have, and I believe this, you will have a content life. How many, let's just talk about Christians today, believers in Christ. How many Christians today are so uncontent? Un discontented, discont they're uncontented, they're not content, they're not content in their lives. Lots of them. If that wasn't true, Christianity would look a lot different today. Christians' lives would look a lot different today. There wouldn't be this constant looking for the next thing, the next thing that God's going to do, the next thing that they can accomplish. They would begin to rest in Christ. Not get comfortable in Christ to where you just sit back and you begin to rot in your faith. But what it will be is you'll become content in who you are in Christ when your priority in Christ is established. Goals, now get this, because this is a concept I really believe in. Goals must feed into your priorities. You get that? Goals must feed into your priorities. Priorities should not feed into your goal. Goals are a way to establish and firm up and accomplish and keep in place the priorities that you have established. Now, I'll give you some examples. In fact, that we'll, we'll do a lot of examples over the next probably couple weeks. Let me say this. Once you establish your priorities, Goals are used to guide you in your daily routine so that you can live according to your priorities. Example, you're married. You want a healthy marriage. Uh, having, wanting a healthy marriage is a priority. Now, what do you do to accomplish a healthy marriage? You have to establish goals to make your marriage healthy. 
I've said it forever. You just can't get married and leave it. You got to nurture it. You got to weed it out. You got to cultivate it. You got to grow it. It's tough. It's fun. It's exhausting. It's wonderful. It's like nuts. It's like fantastic. It's all like bipolar stuff. <laughs> but your goals to build a healthy marriage have to go feet. I'm getting, wait. Healthy marriage is a priority. The goals that you are doing will be to establish and continue to have healthy marriage. For example, communication. You got to learn to communicate. The more you communicate, the better it is. I'm not a great communicator with my wife. I don't know many guys that are. I, she's always telling me, tell, you what you, tell me what you feel. I don't really feel anything right now. Well, tell me what you feel. I'm not feeling anything. You have to be feeling something. Yeah, frustrated. <laughs> you know, but it's communication. And one of the things we've learned, and, and you know, we got, how many couples are getting married this, this year, this coming, four or something? We have four. Katie, Katie you get married? Nice job, huh? So, uh, but, you know, there's like four people and we're doing their marriages. We're getting really tough on couples getting married. So if you're even thinking about it, you better be ready when you come see us. Because we're, we're drilling you. We're, we're nailing you to the wall. We're stripping you down. We're, we're getting it down to the bare, because you know what? It's forever, man. And what we want, we just don't want you to get married so you can fool around. Okay? I mean, that's a plus. But uh, we want you to get married forever. We want you to grow in each other. And what we'll do is one of the things, I mean, we're, we're talking to them and being honest with them and laying out, and we're learning something. One of the things, we haven't done everything right in our marriage. 33 years, we haven't done everything right. But if, we, if I had to like do a, a percentage, I'd say we did about 80% right and about 20% wrong, and that was mostly on her side. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I had to, you know, I had to. But one of the things that we learned the, the, because we watched other people do it right and then we watched other people do it wrong, is as we grew our family, we made sure that her and I still had time with each other somehow. That it was just not constantly raising the kids, not constantly chasing them from this place to the next place to the next place. We hate that stuff. And now that our kids are gone, except for the weekends when they all come home, eat our food, then leave on Sundays and take all our food, uh, and then she goes to the grocery store on Monday to restore it so they can come back and take all our food again on the weekends, but that's okay. We don't have issues. Uh, when we're alone now, we're okay. We don't look at each other like, who are you? Or she don't look at me. And she, well, I know I irritate her. I, I get that. It's not irritate. It probably irritate. No, irritate's probably a good word. But it's like we know each other. You know why? Because we spend time and we establish things. We always said we're not going to be that family when our kids are gone who we're going to look at each other and go, ew, who are you? I don't like you anymore. I don't even know who you are. Because we've sat with couples that have said that. See, some of the goals are you got a, a time together. Parents, and, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me caution you. You got kid, little ones? Please, for the sake of all that is right. Grow a brain. Stop chasing your kids from that thing to that thing to that thing to that thing to that thing. My, oh my. That's insanity. It really is. I've got to be honest with you. I, I've, we've worked with parents. We, I've worked with adolescents for 35 years. I'm telling you. It ain't going to work in the long end of things. Oh, we got them having a, that practice and this practice. And they got this lesson and they got this and they got that. And they got, I'm telling you, you're, you're just setting things up. You're not going to have family. You're not going to have a family when, when it boils down to it. You're, you're not going to have a family. And you know why? Because you think your priorities are right, but your priorities aren't right. First of all, married couples, your priorities are to, first of all, to God. And then the next thing is to each other. And then out of that love uh, is b being established, then your priorities are to your kids, to nurture them, to grow them, to communicate with them, to love them, to discipline them, to show them the right way, to pray over them, to teach them the things of God. Priorities. Okay? That's what you establish in their lives. So please, I'm just being honest with you. you do, pay attention. Pay, I've never seen this turn out right. Never have. Now, other things. Being able to get alone with each other. It's important. That's ways to build a healthy marriage. 
Another one. Put the toilet seat down. <laughs> I know. When they were first married, I'll, I'll, you know, you guys, if I lived by myself before I got married. I'm used to, you know, you leave the seat up. It, it takes extra time to put it up and down. I'll never forget, we were married a couple weeks, maybe. I don't even know if it was that long. You're in bed, you're sleeping, you hear that. It sounds like, remember the Gemini space ca capsules that used to land in the ocean? You know, with a big splash down? <laughs> you sort of hear that sound coming from the bathroom, then you hear this, because it's ice cold water, and then you hear your name being screamed at the top of your lungs, you're like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> the goal is to put the seat down. Why? Because that will further establish a healthy, safer marriage. Now, the same is true with our walk with God. First, establish what your priority list is. Like I said, I really believe there's a few, and if I, I should have wrote, like, I would say I have my top three or four are unmovable. They are always going to remain as they are. Five through whatever, they can shift in their priority list, depending on circumstance. But my top four, they ain't shifting. And it's important that you start to look at what your list really is. A follower in Christ should and must have this, and we're going to finally get to the scripture, this as a top priority, the number one priority in their life. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 33. Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 33. Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 33. If you don't have a Bible today, they're on the table as you go out. Take one, read it, look it up on your Bible app, whatever. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33 says this. Now, this is Christ speaking. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. I went to Bible college. I know that's scary for some of you to think that. I went to Bible college. I actually did very well in Bible college. I took Gospels. I took Old Testament. I took the Pentateuch. I took the Epistles. I took Revelations. I took Theologies. I took Homiletics. I took Hermeneutics. I took all this stuff. And I've sat in Homiletics class, and I've sat, sat in Theology class after Theology class after Theology class. Theology is the study of God. And I tell you what, some of the books that we were given, that we bought to read, were about that thick. And it dealt with one specific thing dealing with God. And I would, I would read them, and I would, you know, take the test, and I would do well. But I always said to myself, you know what, I understand the theology part of Scripture, but I also understand that not everybody in the world has a theological mind. And that somehow it's hard for me to believe God only wrote the Bible for those who have a theological mind. So I think that there are some parts that really, you really need to have a deep understanding of theology to really understand what it really means. But then there's other parts for like some of us, many of us, where God says, you know what, I'm going to throw you a bone. I'm going to make it so simple for you. You won't need a theology, theology just a the, theologian to explain this to you. This is one of those scriptures. Matthew chapter 6, verse number three, 33, Christ says, but seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. So if you don't have a priority list, if you don't know what your priority list is, let me tell you what your priority list should be according to scripture. Not according to Steve, not according to the firehouse, but according to God's holy, inspired, spirit-breathed spirit -breathed word of God. It is this. Seek First, the kingdom of God. Seek first. Christ clearly lays out our number one priority, and hear this, for our new lives. When you come to know Christ, you get a new life. You get a new mind, a new heart, new soul, new spirit. You get new. So when you come to know Christ, your old life is gone. Your old lusts are gone. Your old priority list, hear this, must be gone. 
and you now begin to allow God to establish priorities in your life. That's all part of surrendering your life to Christ. A lot of people want to pray the prayer to know Christ, but they don't want to surrender their lives to Christ. They want to be just the same as they were, but they just want to have a form of fire insurance. And God says, if you're going to come to me, you're going to surrender. You're going to surrender your all. You're going to let me wipe your slate clean so I can give you a brand new set of rules, set of priorities, set of goals in your life. Now, Christ understood this principle so clearly. For example, right before he was arrested, he was in the garden. What did he pray? Father, let this cup pass from me. But then he prays this. But Lord, Dad, not my will, but your will be done. He put a priority. He also says in scripture that I am about my father's business. He wasn't there to impress people. He wasn't there to play up to the crowds. He wasn't there to do the spectacular just to do the spectacular. He was there to serve his father's purpose. In the life of Christ, his number one priority was to seek first the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, that's a must. I mean, that's a non-negotiable. Chair and I, raising our kids, we had, we had rules in our house. We believe in rules in our house. We, from the youngest of age, we believed in rules. We believed in chores. We still do. I remember when they were little enough, started crawling, she would uh, get me two rags, I'd put them on their knees, duct tape them, and off they go on the wood floor. You know, if you throw a ball far enough, they'll, they'll, they're like, like those little sweeper things, you know, <laughs> except you don't have to put batteries in them, you just feed them. And they just, they, you know, we believe in that. We believe that that is important. Kids take ownership. We believe in kids keeping their rooms clean. I, parents, look at me. If you're embarrassed about your kid's bedroom, you're insane. Stop letting the inmates rule the place. Make your kids clean up their room. You're like, oh, I'm not that way. I just want to be their friend. You're a moron. Make your kids clean up. You know why? Guess whose house it is? Yours. It's your house. Now, then again, if your bedroom's a mess, then you have no right to say anything. But I'm just saying. We, we, we believe in rules. Now, growing up, we had what we called steadfast rules for example if we knew our kids were going to go apart to a party where there were no parents not happening if we knew they were going somewhere where there's going to be booze or drugs not happening if they thought they were going to go to a mixed sleepover for sure not happening they they knew i mean some they might have asked us under their breath but they i don't think they were dumb enough to really verbalize can i go to this because we were in the same non-negotiable but then we always looked at there were the little negotiable things, you know, like curfews. We had a set curfew for every kid at every age. And as they approached that age, that was their curfew. But the negotiable part, if there was something special, we would negotiate with them. And we would give them a little extra time. We would ask them what they want, we'd tell them what they want, and we'd finally work out something accordingly. And, and so there was a few little shifts right there. But the fact of the matter is, there are our rules and there are things that have to come to that have to be set in place. And when we come to know Christ, that's exactly what has to happen. Our new life comes into a new set of rules. And those new set of rules are established. Therefore, we hang in there. We stay put in them. Why? Because those help us achieve and hold our priority of keeping God first. So keep first the kingdom of God. Now, when he says this, seeking God's kingdom and his plan will keep keep him number one in your life. It's important that we do that. Next week. Goals for this could be, for example, what must I do to strengthen and hold my priority of God first in my life? What should I do to keep that? One thing should be, I should go to church. And when I hear Christians say, I don't have to go to church to know God. Okay, what are you trying to hide? What are you really trying to cover up? 
because you're trying to cover up something. Because Hebrews 10 something, 24, 25, 3 something Hebrews, says do not forsake the meeting together. Okay? You go to church. You enter into a time of worship. You listen to Christian music during the week. You read your Bible, not because you have to, but because you want to learn so you keep Christ established as a priority in your life. You pray. You pray. Why? Because that will help establish and keep that priority of God first in your life. See, these things are goals that you achieve every day. I'm going to pray today. I'm going to read my Bible today. I'm going to listen to Christian music today. I'm going to try to curb my temper. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Those are goals. And they're all done so that the priority of your life remains first, Christ. So those goals are a way to establish and hold your priority list in, in place. That's as far as we're going to get today, because I don't want to rush. Now, the goals will always, you know, day by day, some of you will do well, some will be hard. But you've got to make a priority list. So I just gave you the first thing that should be on your sheet of paper. So wherever, whenever you get a chance, get your sheet of paper and write it, only if you believe it, kingdom of God, God, Christ, first. Start out there. And then write out your other ones. And hang on to them. And let's see how they pan out. Let me pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. And in your word, Lord, we find hope. And in your word, Lord, we find instruction. And in your word, Lord, we find direction. I pray, God, that through it all, Lord, that we would know and grow in you more, that our, our lives, Father, would be a reflection of you, and that, God, that you would be the top priority of our hearts. I pray, Lord Jesus, that right now, that you would move across this place and people's lives would be established in you. I pray for those who have, don't have you in their life, that today would be the day of their salvation. I pray for those, Lord, who have you in their life, but their priority list is really low of putting you. I pray today would be the day where they move you to the front of the class, top of the list, number one. With your heads bowed for just a moment, I'm going to kind of do this a little different. I'm going to ask two questions, but I want one response. If you want to accept Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, and you want to pray to accept him, in a minute I'm going to ask you to look at me, and then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But the second part of that, if you want to establish God's kingdom as first in your life, I'm going to want you to look at me at the same time, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to do both of them together because I believe both of them are so important. Some of you may know Christ, so you'll answer the second one. Some of you don't know Christ, you're going to answer the first one. But I want you to look at me. Once I see your eyes, you can close your eyes, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer right from here. Starting on my left... You want to pray along with me? Look at me right now. Sure. Any more? Got him. Cool. Got him. Awesome. Okay. My right. Sure. Cool. Got him. It's awesome. Sure. Got him. All right. Pray this. Lord, I first surrender myself to you. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask you come into my life. I ask you establish your kingdom in my heart. I receive you today. And Lord, I want to put you number one. First in the list. Top. Number one. Lord, May my daily life accomplish all that you want it to accomplish to keep you first. May my eyes and may my heart be focused on you. And Lord Jesus, I will seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Lord, I thank you for all those who prayed that prayer. And God, you know who's who. But Lord, establish that in our life so that we might grow in you. Prepare us now, Lord, as we're around the communion table, the God that you would bless this time. We're so thankful for both the bread and the juice, the body and the blood. 
Be with us during this time in Jesus' name.